Lamson 719 was the largest air assault of the Vietnam War. Um, the, Ho Chi Minh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail started in North Vietnam and came down, I believe, through Laos, but definitely into Cambodia yeah. and along the northern part of Vietnam. And uh, one of the major parts of the Ho Chi Minh Trail was in Laos. Right. And um, they decided to make a push with the South Vietnamese Army all the way to Chapon, which is deep inside of Laos, to, because that's where the enemy was. It was just a gigantic combat operation. We took, uh, we took almost every helicopter we had in Vietnam on that assault. They revitalized the old base of Quezon. And it, most people don't know about it, but there was Quezon 1, the famous one, and then there was Quezon 2 that happened during Lam Son 719. That plateau was covered like a beehive with troops. And of course, to, pull it, to protect the main base, you had little outposts all around uh, Lam Son 719, I mean, uh, Quezon. Yeah. yeah, dots, little outposts around the base to detect movement, uh, you know, run little ambushes, and things like that. We moved from True Life to Quang Tree, for the, specifically for this invasion. So every day we would fly out of uh, Quang Tree into Quezon and we would refuel there. And we would take on a load of South Vietnamese troops and go on those missions into Laos. And uh, we would fly towards, towards Japan and drop them off at these uh, various locations. I have no idea where they were, but they were well inside of Laos. And in the beginning, the South Vietnamese troops were just, I mean, they were slaughtering these. I mean, because they dropped them right on up the, the enemy and the enemy ran. And um, so that's what we're doing every day. Refueling in Quezon, taking off again. Um, actually, the refueling, a lot of it was done at a place called Lang Vey, which is which is oh. part of that story. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and then we That's and fine. then we the, to Laos, we dropped these guys, these poor, we dropped these poor bastards off, and and of course, as everybody knows, um, they pushed the enemy deep back into a concentrated area where the enemy regrouped and came back at them in a probably one of the most successful counterattacks in history. It was horrible. The initial flights were putting those guys in, and then I did a couple of flights of trying to get them back out. Chaotic landing zones, guys hanging onto the skids, just like in the movies, but they're actually hanging onto the skids. But yeah, I talk right into this and I'm looking this way, talking into this little microphone saying, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, take it up, take it up, you know. And he's hitting the stick and he's taking it up. And there's a uh, there's a South Vietnamese army soldier hanging on the skit, you know. Thankfully, he let go. Once his feet were two feet off the ground, he let go. What was your impression of the Arvin forces. I mean, did you have confidence in them as a fighting force? You know, normally, based on everything that I'd heard, and even some of what I'd seen, I would say no. But the ones that I saw on this, actually, that's a good question because I saw some regular Arvin troops. And they they were no better than than uh, American uh, troops that didn't want to be there. You know, the guy with the bad attitude. What am I doing here? I don't want to be here. Um, and I I did see a little bit of that. We had just come back from Laos, and all these guys jump out of the helicopter, but there's one guy that's not getting out of the helicopter. So I looked at him. And he's, you can see he's got blood all down his shirt. He's got blood all down his shirt. And I realized he's too wounded to get out of the helicopter. So I unplugged and um, 
I put him over my shoulder, but as I got him o- up over here, you know, to, to me, to, to carry, the guy had a section missing here in the shoulder. It was like the size of half a grapefruit just missing. It's like he got hit with a cannonball almost, just blown away. So naturally, I mean, he, he, he was going to bleed out because uh, I carried him. I put him in the truck and I started screaming at these Vietnamese soldiers. They didn't give a crap about him. They didn't. They just left him in the in the bird. I had to carry him out. and I had my moment screaming at him and they didn't care. They were all in shell shock or some kind of shock. They just wanted to get out of there. It was it was bad what happened to them when the NDA attacked, counterattacked in Laos. You indicated in what you've written that you doubted, given based on what you've seen and based on what you'd experienced, that the Arvin forces, once the Americans left, you doubted that the Arvin forces would really be able to stand up against the North Vietnamese. Do I, do I have that right? Were you skeptical that the Arvins really would be able to stand up against the North Vietnamese? Yeah, well, because the, the uh, aura of failure was just in the air. I mean, you know, the handwriting had been on the wall for me for America the whole time. And now I'm seeing these guys that just had success turn into defeat, you know? And coming into this landing zone after this route, after they got just their ass handed to them, you know, coming down from the sky, I would look down and I saw a mob below me. I didn't see any orderly uh, guys securing a perimeter or or bunches. Usually they they pack in groups, you know, this is going to be the first flight, this is going to be the second flight. The only thing below me was a mob. And that's why I had to tell the, 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 the pilot, I had to do a countdown for him. It was a mob and I, I saw white all over the, the landing zone that I realized a lot of it was bandages. I'll never forget the white spots all over that landing zone. Those are bandages. And it's funny too, because we had green bandages, I think, but I saw a lot of white down there. Wow. Um, so you're, you know, the, the, the primary mission of Lamb Sun 17, or certainly a primary mission of Lamb Sun 17, is to, is to, is to cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And right. did you know at the time that this effort had been going on for at least six years by this point that, you know, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was getting bombed constantly north and south. But here we are in 1971, still trying to shut this thing down. Did you did at the time, did you know that you were at the tail end of of something that had been going on for years trying to shut this trail down? Uh no, actually, uh, back then as a kid, um, I knew that there were more enemy on the other sides of the border. I mean, that that, that was clear. We heard the story about special forces guys. And even as a ranger, you know, we had some forays on the Cambodian border. If you wanted to catch them, for sure, you went to any border. And, and uh, as you've seen in the maps, the Ho Chi Minh Trail came down like in three or four different areas in right. South Vietnam, and I'm sure there were areas that weren't official Ho Chi Minh Trail, but I'm right. sure they were used. Because, you know, if you want to be safe, you just simply hop on the other side of the fence. And that's where all the the uh, concentrations of enemy were. By the time they got into South Vietnam, it was, it was go time. It was hide, you know, spread out. I, I you know, you, you had company-sized units, but um, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was 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 like a some walk in the park for the enemy. Uh, they could walk in groups of a hundred, chat, everything else on the other side of those borders. Bombing runs, special forces they the only, they were the only things they had to be afraid of on the other side of any border, most of the time. Well, and you mentioned that. Um... I believe some B-52s that you witnessed when some B-52s that had come out of Thailand, they they hit the, the trail. Is that right? Uh, yep. We were flying in Laos and um, 
I know it was Laos, and there was a plateau beneath me. And we just, we weren't delivering anybody that day. We were just flying in case anybody else went down. Um, we were flying shotgun in case anybody else went down. I just did circles at 11,000 feet, about 11,000 feet. It was as high as a helicopter could go. We were out of uh, gunfire range, but not anti-aircraft range. And um, we were flying round and round this plateau that just kept getting... I could see the puffs of smoke. Each little puff was a mortar round hitting it, or a rocket or something, or artillery. And just puff, 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 all over this plateau. And I just recall think, thinking, I, I, these poor sons of bitches that are on that plateau, there's a reason all those puffs are going off on that plateau, and it's to get the guys on that plateau. And they were Arvin, I'm assuming? Huh? These were Arvin guys who were under mortar yeah. fire? Yeah. Arvins that were on that plateau. I mean, they, they had to be getting decimated. I mean, it, it, to me, it looked like there were five strikes every two seconds of explosions going off on a plateau that I think was, I don't know, I'm going to guess a quarter or a half a mile wide. And uh, we got the, the call that an arc light was coming in, a B-52 run was coming in. And uh, they made their pass. It was incredible. I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, it sounds cliche, but it was just like the movies. Just like it. Thunderous. I'm, I mean, I'm two and a half miles up in the air, and I could feel the shock, the shock from these explosions hitting. Wow. And um, two lines of explosives went off. It seemed like about a half a mile. All the puffs of smoke stopped. Wow. All the little puffs on, on that plateau. Uh, at, later, after action um, guys went in there, I guess they're special ops guys or something, maybe forward observers, who knows what, and they uh, reported that there was like entire companies of North Vietnamese soldiers dead from that airstrike. Wow. And I think you say that you didn't even see the B-52s. You just No. Yeah. I, and, and to this day, I wonder, was he that high? Or was I not looking in the right place? Clearly, he was overhead someplace. Yeah. Because wow. the bombs fell not that far away from where I was. If, if, I, if I had to draw a straight line from me down to the ground, and then from the ground to where the B-52 strike was, I would say it was no more than a mile, maybe two. I don't know. Yeah. But I kept looking up like this. I kept looking up. I could see nothing. Lamson 719, the, during this route, the, during this counter punch that the, the, the NBA did, there wasn't a lot of time to prepare. At one point, these guys, I saw them packing parachutes in. At Quezon, because we'd stop at Quezon, you know, we'd stop at Quezon and they would talk to flight guys and Vietnamese, the pilots would talk to Vietnamese officers and, you know, regarding this invasion. And uh, while I never actually went to those meetings, only the officers were allowed in there, the pilots, uh, I, I looked around and, and I saw, I saw um, Marines furiously packing sea rations. For their counterparts, I guess, in Laos, United States Marines, furiously packing this. I think they were Marines. But anyway, this guy's packing sea rations with with, uh, with parachutes. And I, I saw that. And then, while we're flying there, and I remember that time, I don't know if it was the same day or another time, but I saw them pushing these sea rations out the, out the, the floor of another helicopter below me. I'm flying at about 11,000 feet, and they were about 8,000 feet, and they were getting shot at. And I actually saw ricochets off of the helicopter. I'm digressing here a little bit, but there's a reason. I actually saw bullets, uh, tracer bullets ricocheting off the helicopter, which surprised me because the helicopter is very soft. You can punch it and dent it. It's nothing more than corrugated soup can metal, if you will. But anyway, so I actually saw bullets ricocheting off this helicopter, and I thought, my God, 
If I could see one ricochet, others must be penetrating. And then I saw them sliding these sea ration cases out of the bird. Not a single parachute opened. Not one. He pushed case after case out. The same cases that I saw getting packed back at Quezon, one after another, not a single parachute opened. Because they had been prepared so quickly, they were they they weren't prepared correctly. Very possibly, yes. Very probably, yes. Yeah. You write about um um at least one of the missions, probably more than one, but one of the missions um involving picking up um killed in action. Um and there's something you wrote about that that I wanted to I wanted to ask you about. So I want to read this uh, sentence or two from your memoir. So you're looking at these um, at these bodies that are in the bird that you've picked up, and you say, as we flew, I turned around repeatedly to look at the bodies on my ship. And then here's the sentence that catches my attention: my heart went out to them but it could not reach them. All my thoughts were simply reflected back to me. I could do nothing for them. And when I read those lines, I was reminded of what I've heard so many times from, from vets who say, you know, of course, sometimes if a buddy is, is killed, of course, it, it has a, a big impact. But there are other cases where you're in that situation and you think, you know, I should feel for these guys but honestly mainly what i feel was or mainly what i felt was at that moment i'm glad it wasn't me and you just kind of move on just you know that pressure cooker of war and and what it does to us psychologically um i don't know if what i was what i just said makes any sense to you but there's that line where you said you know i sent my heart out to these kias in the helo but my heart couldn't reach them um it was you know it just reflected back on me and was that the sense that you know well these poor these poor guys didn't make it but at least i'm still alive yeah well i didn't think about the i'm still alive part because i was you know completely detached from them they were infantry guys on the ground and i'm, I'm a helicopter door gunner at this point but looking at them it was sad it was very, very sad. One guy curled up. And I could even imagine. I imagined the way he died, you know. Um, and there was a disconnect there. Uh, as sad as it was, there was little emotion involved. It was just sad that these guys had died down there on the ground. Is, and is that... uh, is that I kept going and looking at them, and um, that's that's the, the, the only emotion I felt was that it was sad. That's it. Is that because you know the incredible intensity, and you're flying day after day after day after day after day, mission after mission after mission after mission, after mission. the incredible intensity, um, the exhaustion, the constant adrenaline the and then the drain when the adrenaline wears off you know all of that stuff is it almost like that in that context you know really feeling for other people is just it's 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 a luxury of energy that's just not there because energy has to go into so many other things uh just to get each operation done is is that part of it that you just don't have time you don't have the psychological space or you know really you know you feel for these guys but you know not really at the same time is is that it it does it's just that's just a luxury you can't really afford at that time just because there's so much going on that's tapping your energy that's tapping your your spiritual energy your psychological energy everything else uh, yeah pretty much so but there was a phenomenon that I noticed over there that uh, while things were happening, you felt you felt very little. It was later when you had time to think about it, but in real time, you felt very little. Now, 
In real time, I didn't see these guys die. But in real time, I was flying with them. And uh, I just kept looking back at them. And and I, and I got the drift of sadness, but there are these guys, the, those two bodies in that helicopter, I can see as clearly today as I did back then. And uh, back then, I probably would, would have remembered them that night less than I do today. That's how indelibly etched they are. One was wrapped in a poncho liner. His, the entire body had just been blown into, into a ball of jelly, wrapped in a poncho liner that was leaking body fluid. And the other one obviously died of either gunshot or shrapnel wounds. Uh, his entire face was blackened and gray, for, as in maybe soot or something. It wasn't camouflage paint. He had been in some kind of blast. His face was blackened, and he was curled, and it was clear that he'd gotten multiple injuries to his torso. You couldn't see them, 